Hey, greetings, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, and welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Better dig deep and put them in the ground. Blood on their hands, they're hell bound. Save us all. Who they gonna burn it down? Save us all. Before they burn it down. This episode of the Steadfast and Law Podcast is brought to us by our friends at the United States Concealed Carry Association. The USCCA is about something bigger than just the right to bear arms. It's a resource to help you be ready for the before, during, and after of a self-defense incident. And as long as we have the progressive socialist leftists releasing violent criminals off the streets, seeking to defund police officers and law enforcement, there will be more self-defense incidents out there. If you're not one of the 500,000 plus responsibly armed Americans who are proud USCCA members, then now is the time to explore USCCA membership. Click learn more below right now to learn about the life-saving education industry leading training and self-defense liability insurance. Trust me, you don't want to wait until it's too late. Plus, it's 100% risk-free with the USCCA's money-back bulletproof no pun intended, guarantee. Guys and gals, the USCCA exists to help you avoid danger and keep your loved ones safe. That's your responsibility. That's why we have the Second Amendment. Make the commitment today to responsibly protect yourself and your family. Join the United States Concealed Carry Association right now for instant access to industry-leading educational resources, expert-led training, and self-defense liability insurance. Get the peace of mind that you deserve. Click Learn More to activate your membership today and start receiving the Concealed Carry magazine that comes up for every two months. I get mine. It really helps me. And also just remember the USCCA is not an insurance company. A policy has been issued to the USCCA by Universal Fire and Casualty Insurance Company. That policy provides the association and its members with self-defense liability insurance subject to its terms, conditions, limitations, and exclusions. Dial up right now, click learn more, and become a member of the United States Concealed Carry Association. We'll be right back. C.J. Pearson is a college freshman. He used to be at this place called University of Alabama, but <laughs> now, I mean, I think he broke out in hives, so he's looking for another place. And he's a <laughs> lifelong Georgian, which is one of the reasons I love this young man dearly. Best known for his incisive online political commentary, raised by Democrats, same as me, but conservative values, C.J. has taken a path in life few would expect, emerging as a leading voice among right-leaning youth across America. Pearson has amassed more than half a million followers on social media, young and old, through his impassioned commentary that speaks to individuals concerned about the future and direction of America. Maybe you remember, young C.J. Pearson first became interested in politics when his first grade class held a mock presidential election representing that of the 2008 United States presidential election. Pearson states that the class was instructed to research the political views of then U.S. Senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, who ran as the Democratic presidential nominee and Senator from Arizona, John McCain, who ran as the Republican presidential nominee. C.J. voted for John McCain in the mock election because he was inspired by McCain's military service and began following political news topics. Aged eight. He started blogging in support of different conservative politicians in Georgia and participated in political campaigning in the 2014 United States midterm elections, conducting door-to-door -door and telephone surveys. After the 2014 midterm elections, C.J. Pearson founded a political group named Young Georgians in Government 
to involve young people in the political process and develop solutions for government. CJ's passion for politics extends offline, and he has served in a variety of roles within Republican campaigns at all levels of government. He has also made frequent appearances in the national media and has been featured on Fox News, The Blaze, Newsmax TV, and One America News Network. CJ Pearson, Merry Christmas, and welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. Good to see you as well, Colonel. Always a pleasure. Well, I tell you what, I have sat back and just followed and watched you grow mm-hmm. since you first came on the scene. Uh, you know, and it's just amazing to me the years that have passed. I mean, what a decade? No, twelve years now. So now you're twenty years of age. Catch us up on some of the things you've been doing over the past twelve years. Yeah, you know, it's been great. I, you know, I've had the opportunity to fight for America in, in so many ways and, 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 and help more young people like me understand what conservative values actually are. You know, the left has been incredibly intentional about in, indoctrinating young people from, you know, college campuses to high schools, and we're seeing it as early as elementary schools. And so, you know, I, I grew up in, in the church, and I think the Bible is very clear when it says that train up in a child in the way in mm-hmm. which they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. And I think that that is a lesson that more and more people on the right need to learn. Uh, You know, before we send our nation's young people to these colleges where they're going to be taught all the bad things about America, how evil America is, how racist America is, let's teach them the truth about America, how it's a land of opportunity, a land of freedom. And uh, that's just been a a big focus and passion um, uh, or, or guiding light of the work that I've been doing. But also to reaching of you know other people in the black community as well and showing them that the left does not care for us. They use and abuse us. Look at the state of the black community in every single progressive ran city across the country. Look at Chicago. Look at Detroit, uh, where it is where you cannot even allow your black child to go play on a sidewalk without having to think about whether or not they may not come home because of the lawlessness that is that is uh, taken over so many cities um, that have been virtually single ran uh, by, by the by the left, uh, you know, for decades. And so it, it's been incredible ride and, and now I have the opportunity to work with Prager U uh, and, and help uh, reach more and more young people. So it's it's been an incredible journey and you know it's it's been a trail blazed by people like you. So it's great to oh. be here with you. Well you're too kind and uh, that's what leadership is about. It's not about what you yourself attain and achieve. It's about setting the conditions for someone such as yourself to come on and you're supposed to blaze that trail for you. Now, you just brought up something that's very near and dear to my heart about the decimation of the black community based upon the policies of the progressive socialist left. And now recently we are hearing about this talk of reparations, which to me is reprehensible. Uh, How do you see this thing? I mean, I just see it as another means by which the left is trying to buy off the, the support of the black community. You know, you're, you're, you're exactly spot on. And I see it for what it is. Uh, it is exactly that. They're seeking to dangle a carrot in front of the faces of members of the black community and say, hey, if you behave, if you vote the right way, we'll toss you a few dollars here and there. But what does that actually do for the black community? You know, I've talked about reparations often. I don't want it. I don't need it. Probably because of the fact that I wasn't a slave and no one alive to date was. And also no one alive to date owned a slave. But if we really do want to get serious about reparations, let's talk about the people who actually owe reparations to black people. It's the left. It's the founders of the KKK. It's the founders of Jim Crow. It's the founders of desegregation. It was the left that put my great grandparents on the back of the bus, not the right. And so uh, if, 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 if we are really seriously talking about reparations, it's probably George Soros who should be cutting that check, not the mm-hmm. United States government. No, you're absolutely right. And that's part of what you just said, that we need to have a real uh, – exegesis of history and talk about that relationship because the party of Jim Crow, the party of poll taxes, literacy tests, lynchings, and all these things, the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson have done more to harm the black community. When you talk about defunding police, that hurts the black community even more so. So when you look at the young black conservative movement or the young conservative movement right now, what are the things that we need to be doing? Because you are the future. You are the next generation. And I was very upset to see that a lot of young people in this last midterm election, they fell for that lie about getting their college uh, student loan debt uh, repaid because that's unconstitutional. You can't do that by executive order. So yeah. what are the focuses that you have there at Prager University? 
You know, one thing that I find incredibly interesting about my generation, we don't always vote this way, but we only voted in a few elections. So I think there's still a lot of time to reach us is that we actually really do appreciate freedom a lot. You know, I graduated high school in, in 2020 and it, it was a year. It was the first year of the pandemic. A lot of people lost their graduations. They lost their proms. They lost their freedom um, to live. You know, my first year of college, um, I spent in my dorm room, learning from Zoom, still paying the same amount of tuition than I would have if I was in the lecture hall, but still, I was learning from a classroom. We were told that we couldn't hang out with one another. We couldn't socialize. We couldn't go to concerts. We couldn't see our families. Uh, we saw what it was really like to live in a very tyrannical environment. And I think that young people need to be reminded of that uh, and, and the way in which freedom is not easily won, but it is very much so easily lost. And so I think that's incredibly important. Um, but I also think too, is that as we grow older and what's interesting about the midterms is if you actually look at some of the deeper analysis that's come out, while a lot of Gen Z did vote, um, you know, for progressive and, and left-leaning candidates, it actually decreased from previous midterms. So in 2018, there's actually a lot more support for, you know, folks on the left among that under 30 demographic than there was in 2022. It dropped by 11 points. Mm -hmm. And it's not a surprise because if you look at what's going on in America, every time you go and fill up your gas tank, every time you go to the grocery store, you're not given much of a reason to support these people with any passion and enthusiasm. And so I think that gives you a, a, a pathway at least to what we can achieve with these with these folks. We need to make the selections about the bread and butter issues. Uh, at the end of the day, student loan debt, that's temporary, but inflation, that's something that everyone's going through. If you can't put food on the table and you can't fill up your gas tank and, and, and do anything and go anywhere, uh, what really really are you getting from this administration? Uh, and I think that as you grow older and you get a lot more responsibilities, it becomes an easier choice to make. You know, there's that old saying that if you're, you know, if you're conservative before 20, you have no heart. But if you're conservative, mm -hmm. if you're not a conservative after you have no brain. And so I think uh, it just comes with age. You just get a lot smarter. And uh, I, I think that this generation is worth saving, worth fighting for. And there's a lot of hope um, to be had. So good. So you're telling me that I do have some benefit for having all this gray hair. So <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, and also, too, it's like the woke agenda is pushing yeah. so many young people away from the left. People are tired of this cancel culture nonsense, things that used to be entirely odd not okay, uh, egregious even, um, are now trying to be pushed on the throats as, as something that we must accept as a society. I'm sorry, but the vast majority of young people in this nation aren't okay with the idea that five-year-olds, six-year-olds should be able to mutilate their genitals. Uh, yeah. They're also not okay with things like the Balenciaga ad campaign that sexualizes children. Mm -hmm. They're not okay with uh, biological men actually Scratch that. There is no such thing as biological men. There are only men. They're not okay with men playing women's sports because – why would they be? And so I think as the left in, in, embraces this radical agenda, I'm not sure who they're, uh, you know, testing this messaging on. But as far as like the most young people that I, that I see, you know, here in the South and now, you know, out West, but they just think it's crazy. They think it's nonsense. And at the end of the day, I think they're going to lose a lot more people uh, than, the, than they stand to gain. From it. Let me ask you this, because with Elon Musk taking over Twitter, we're getting a lot of revelations about the collusion between the federal government, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and this social media platform. How do you think that affects young people? Because when you talk about freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, are they concerned about this collusion and the pressure that you see coming from, you know, I call it the new East German Stasi police, the mm -hmm. FBI, and suppressing their ability to freely uh, communicate? Are they worried about the surveillance state? You know, I think it's important that we communicate uh, the importance of why they should be worried about it. I think that, you know, especially as you look at the emergence of things like TikTok and their close relationship with the CCP, um, mm -hmm. privacy is something that's definitely important to our generation. I think they need to see in the ways in which it's been trampled upon today. Uh, what's interesting, Colonel, and I'm sure that, uh, that you've seen it as well. What's interesting is that we were called conspiracy theorists yes. for believing in this stuff, right? We were, we, were, we were told that we were crazy, we're making things up, big tech doesn't care about censoring us, whatever. But now because of Elon Musk's ask, acquisition of Twitter in the Twitter files, we're seeing all of this stuff come to light. And we are, again, vindicated. It seems as if like every single day, if someone calls a conspiracy theorist, maybe you're actually the only one in the room telling the truth. Uh, and we've seen just, and I think it, it just connects more broadly to the issue. I think young people are also just more so than anything, sick and tired of being lied to, right? 
you mentioned the student loan debt um, proposal uh, that was that was made to to eliminate and forgive all the student loan debt didn't happen, not happening anymore. It was dangling in the front of, uh, of young people's faces as, as another carrot um, before the midterm elections, and now it's just not happening. And so tired of that lie. We're tired of the lie that, you know, conservative of speech isn't being systematically targeted by big tech, and now we see government actors. Tired of that lie. I think people want honesty, uh, and, and they want it in, in a way that doesn't insult their intelligence. And uh, it seems as if that seems to be the only thing the left is good at these days. Let's switch... Uh topics a little bit because you're there you're native georgian same as myself of course you know ever since you know leaving to go into the military i haven't fully resided in georgia but let's talk about this past midterm election cycle what do you think of the lessons learned there and what do you think that the herschel walker campaign could have done a little better the georgia gop and the rnc in georgia uh, once again we lost another senate runoff election uh we're over three in, yeah. the, in the last couple of years. So what are your assessments of the uh, the state of politics in Georgia? You know, you know, oftentimes as conservatives, we talk about the need to build a wall on, a, on, a, on the southern border. Maybe we need to build it around red states uh, so that all these people that are leaving and fleeing California and New York don't come to the south and continue to vote the same way. Um, that's definitely been a big part of it. But I think also in terms of campaign strategy, the right conservatives, we need to be a lot more intentional about reaching urban communities. We need to be more intentional about reaching young people because there truly is an opportunity there. Um, but also, I think too. We got to run up the margins in, in rural places. You know, what we saw in the November election compared to the runoff is that Herschel did, uh, you know, did underperform um, in in uh, December as, as opposed to what he was able to do in November. And so I think it needs to be multifaceted strategy. We need bold, new uh, energy. We need bold, new ideas. But we also need to go to the places where conservatives oftentimes don't go. We need to go in urban communities because I think when you really start contextualizing these issues for people, um, in these communities about inflation, about gas prices, people care about that stuff because it affects their day-to-day -day life. And at the end of the day, um, here's the reality. We're not going to get every person of color yeah. um, to vote Republican, to vote red. That's just not going to happen. Um, but what we can do is make them think twice about voting for the status quo. And I think uh, that that's how we win. Well, it's incrementalism, and we have never looked at it that way. It's an all-or-nothing strategy when it comes down for the RNC. And so they say, well, it's no need to go into these communities because you can't win them over. But if you yeah. can go in and get 10 to 15 percent, 15 to 20 percent, that's two torpedoes in the, in the broad side of the SS progressive socialists. And when you start to bring to light all of the failures of their policies, like I said, the fatherlessness issue, the, uh, the lack of small business entrepreneurs, the fact that we are murdering unborn babies in the black community at an astronomical, almost genocidal rate, and all of these things come together, we've got to start making those inroads. You know, I, I used to tell people when I was the chairman here that the Republican Party of Texas was founded on Independence Day of 1867 by mm -hmm. 150 black men. And wow. you have Republicans that didn't even know that. And, and I'm yeah. saying, how can you win if you don't even know your own background, you don't even know your own history. So yeah. what would be some of the things that you would uh, try to implement if there was a change in strategy for us to go into these urban communities? Yeah, I think what well, we need to target, we need to tar target urban black media. We need to go on the radio. We need to go in the community. We need to have these interviews with folks like Charlemagne the God on The Breakfast Club, sit down with Shannon Sharp, all of these people. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these people are greatly influential in the black community. And I'm not going to say that we're going to change the hearts and minds of those hosts or everyone in their audience, but at least for the first time, a lot of people in their audiences will hear from a conservative. And people hate what they don't understand. And so they listen to CNN, they listen to the mainstream media, and, and they paint you know every conservative with such a broad brush. They were racist, they were this, they were that. That, but they've never actually heard from a conservative themselves. You know, it's interesting. I was at a conference in um, Phoenix this past weekend. I was in an Uber, uh, and my Uber driver was like, "I can't believe that you know all these like people that like Trump and all these conservatives are in town and all these things." And uh, it was a black guy, and I was like, you know, so what do you think about what's going on in the country right now, like with this, you know, all these inflation, with gas prices, with, uh, you know, trading Brittany Griner, but leaving a Marine there, and he's like, yeah, I don't really like that, but like, I've never really heard it talked about that way. It's probably mm -hmm. the first time he's ever heard um, someone just really talk about conservative ideas to him. 
And he, and then as I got out of the car, he was like, you gave me a lot to think about. And so I think, yeah, we need to target urban media. We need to not be afraid to go places where we don't usually go. We need to go into the black churches and talk about what is happening truly today in our society about, again, the, the fatherlessness issue, taking the black father out of the home, also about emasculating black men. That's also a big thing there. Um, but also, too, if you look at anyone in the black evangelical community, you think they're down for the idea that a child should be able to change their gender, uh, you know, as a toddler? Mm -hmm. No, uh, but we're not talking about those issues. And if you want to go even further than that, let's talk about immigration, about the crisis that's happening on our southern border and talk about who that disproportionately affects its members of the black community. It affects labor. It affects opportunity. It affects government resources. If if, tr if we truly believe as a people that we're not being well served by our government, then how do we feel when illegal aliens are treated better than we are, right? And so I think like we just have to, we have a winning message. We just have to tell it and we need to tell it strategically uh, and we need to make the investment. Our money has to, uh, we got we to gotta match, we got to match that. You know, our priority, we say it's a priority, but where is our money going? Uh, and we got to invest in that effort fully. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you want to talk about replacement theory, when you're bringing in 5 million people illegally into the United States of America, that's what's replacing the, the black community. And you're right. That's one of the things I said. I hate the word outreach because outreach always means you show up in Black History Month and people never see you again until two or three months before the election. It has to be consistent and constant engagement. Uh, right. along all the aspects of black communications and black culture. So yeah. with that being said, are you going to ever look at, you know, running for elected office? Are you going to get involved in a leadership position in the Georgia GOP? Because, I mean, you are just phenomenal. You are That's just so insightful. You're so well-spoken and you can get to the core of these issues. And you're only 20 that's what I'm trying to tell people is that we've got to get our young people running for school board, running for city council, running for county commission. So what has God laid on your heart? I know you out there with uh, with the folks with uh, Prager University, but what other things or opportunities could you look at doing? Yeah, and Colonel, well, I'm passionate about America. Uh, and that's fueled my activism ever since I was just 12 years old making YouTube videos in, mm -hmm. in, in my bedroom in Augusta, um, you know, to, to what I took to college and, and to what I do now in PragerU. I'm passionate about this country. And I believe that, you know, America has never been a great nation by accident, but it's been a great nation uh, through persistence uh, and through the continued passion of people who aren't willing to sit on the sidelines, but are willing to fight for the greatest nation in the world. Uh, because, you know, as I said earlier, freedom is not hard. Uh, is not easily won, but it is easily lost. And so, you know, I'm looking at, you know, a, a, in any way that I can give back to the country that's given back to me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to. And, you know, whether it's reaching young people now or people, you know, in, in our community, the black community, um, with new ideas and a new approach, uh, I'm, I'm happy and excited to do it. There's a lot of ways to do it. And so it, it truly is, you know, God's plan. And I'm, I'm listening to him. I'm letting him direct my steps. But uh, it's been it's been a great journey. And I'm excited to see what happens in the future. This is our last podcast for this calendar year. And about, of course, we're about to go into Merry Christmas. Let's close with your Christmas hopes, wishes, thoughts, and also what are the things that you see happening going into 2023? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's been it's been it's been a great year, all things considered. I think that despite uh, what we are seeing uh, in, in Washington, the fecklessness, the lack of leadership, uh, and, and and unfortunately, an agenda that is see, is seriously tried to undermine the foundational values of what made this country what it is today. I think that what I still see is hope because I still see people fighting. I think you lose hope when you see people start to give up. And throw in the towel. But when I see like leaders like Kerry Lake and and and, and Governor DeSantis and, and and so many more who are just fighting, uh, and I know that you're fighting, I know that I'm still fighting. Mm -hmm. I think there's still hope to be had. And so I think we need to keep that same energy going into 2023. Uh, I think that we have the winning ideas, we have the winning platform, and and I think that we just need to be intentional about seeking out new people, growing the tent, um, not just preaching to the choir, but growing the congregation. And so uh, that's my hope. And I hope that everyone listening and watching has a Merry Christmas as well. And I hope you do as well. Thank you so much. And where can people follow you and all the things that you're doing? Yeah, definitely. So I'm on all the social media. So you can catch me on Twitter at VCJ Pearson, Instagram, same username, Facebook as well. And then, of course, be sure to check out PragerU and the work we're doing there. Well, I just want to say, CJ, when I see you, uh, it just really warms my soul because 
all the things that men and women such as myself and, of course, all through my family, having gone out on battlefields to protect and preserve the greatest constitutional republic that the world has ever known. And to see someone like you, you know, stay the course from the first grade all the way to now, you can always know that I'm in your corner and, and I'm here to support you and bolster you in any way, shape, form, and fashion. So thank you so much, C.J. Pearson, for being on the Steadfast and Law podcast. God bless you and Merry Christmas. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, greetings, everyone. Thanks so very much for joining us on this episode of the Steadfast and Law podcast. What an amazing young man C.J. Pearson is. The fact that he got started as a first grader, eight years of age, and still out there, better espousing insights on conservatism and the political atmosphere than a lot of adults can do. And that's what gives us hope. When we can still raise up young men and young women like that, the hope of America, our future, is still bright. And so we need to make sure that we're fostering CJ and visit him at his website, visit, visit him at Prager University. And of course, please click the like button and share this podcast with others. And I just want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Before they burn it down